This is Chris Evangelista with SlashFilm.com. I recently had a chance to go to the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. in honor of the impending home video release of Mission Impossible Fallout. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch this YouTube video. It will self-destruct in five minutes. I'm just kidding, that won't really happen. While at the Spy Museum, I spoke with Wolf Blitzer and Christopher Joner about the scene they shared together at the beginning of the film. Beware of spoilers. I wonder if you could both talk about what you both thought of this scene when you first read it, because it starts off very dark and then obviously becomes... But don't give it away. <laughs> yes, without giving away the, the spoiler, it yeah. becomes very amusing. So I'm wondering what you both thought of the scene and what the specific direction was for both of you, because Christopher, I love your reaction when you see the twist. And Wolf, obviously, you're playing yourself, but not I'll put a spoiler <laughs> so I'm wondering what what you both thought of the scene well it's an intense scene uh, and it's uh, uh, I think it's a pretty exciting scene it's, it's, it's fun fun to be in a scene like that because things are happening and there's a lot of uh, twists and turns so I enjoyed it very much I, I loved uh, being in it I loved uh, I loved the whole feel of it uh, uh, as somebody who's, who's watched all the Mission Impossible films and the, the TV series in the olden days, uh, it was just exciting for me to, you know, to see what was going on. And that scene was so dramatic and so powerful. I didn't really appreciate how important it was and how good it was and exciting it was until I actually, a year later, sat down and watched the film. And, and you could see it. Uh, they did a great job. Was there one specific direction that Christopher McQuarrie gave either of you that really stood out? Or was it basically just... The script stuff for itself. Yeah, it, well, he didn't talk that much. It was like we go in there and see what happens, kind of like, and we, yeah. So it, it was really exciting. It's just because uh, every take got a little different. So and then, yeah. He's a great director, hmm. uh, and I loved working with him, and, and loved working with Tom Cruise, loved working with Christopher. Uh, but the thing that uh, when we were filming that scene, and we did it, my role, for about three days, was that, uh, you know, they wrote the, the scene, they wrote the script, they wrote what I was going to say, uh, but a, a few lines uh, would, it would not what I would really say if it were the real Wolf Blitzer in the Situation Room on CNN. And so as we were going through it, uh, we would take a break, and I would say to him, you know, uh, I wouldn't say it like that. I would say it like this, and he said, okay, let's do it the way you would do it. And we redid it the way I would really do it if it were, you know, CNN. So, uh, and, he, and he just, he rolled with it. He, he totally appreciated it. He wanted it to be as realistic as possible, and that's why he's such a great director. Hmm. Um, Wolf, did you have to study Simon Pegg by any chance to get this down? Did you go full method and like follow him around? For no, I think uh, he spent some time studying me. Really? But uh, I didn't spend much time studying him, but he was great. Really? Yeah. Could not have been nicer. Did we get it? Of course we got it. I also spoke with real life former spies Peter Ernest and Jonna Mendez. Neither of them actually looks like a spy, but trust me, they really were spies at one point. Could you each talk about how you got into your line or really how you both became spies for life? <laughs> okay, um, I certainly am happy to. I had, uh, I had been in the service, military service, got out, and I was told some people wanted to interview me. I had no idea who they were, and I won't go into the backstory. Um, <clears throat> but they were telling me about this agency, uh, CIA. I had never heard the term. I'd been overseas for two years. And... Uh, and it dealt, with, it dealt with the things that were uh, of great import then, the Soviet Union, spread of world communism, and so forth. And it would involve going overseas, learning languages, travel. All of that really attracted me. 
I would not have known a CIA operation if it had bitten me. I knew nothing about what we now know as the clandestine service, covert operations, and so forth. It was only after I joined and started going through these interview process and was asked questions and got into training that it really hit me what I was about. And this is now, this is in a particular period of time. Today, you know, we're inundated with movies and novels and books about CIA. Everybody knows what CIA does, sort of. You know, it used to be almost like a parlor game at CIA. You'd have your next assignment, you'd go, you'd go to wherever it was, there'd be a welcoming cocktail party, you'd have a drink in your hand, people would say, how'd you get in? How did you get in? How did you get in? And everyone always had kind of fun stories. Had a story, yeah. Except me, I never had a fun story <laughs> because I was uh, living and working um, overseas. I was working in a bank and these uh, young people were coming in my age and I got to know them. I started going out with them. Um, I ended up a year and a half later marrying one of them in Switzerland, and I didn't know until two days before I married him that he wasn't a Department of Army civilian, that he was a CIA employee. And not unlike Peter, I wasn't really clear on what the CIA was, <laughs> but I was gonna yeah. marry him anyway, right. and I did. Um, then, then we went off to um, the Far East for, on an assignment, and you know it turned into a career um, um, working for the CIA. I started working for them overseas, ended up working back here in D.C. What's, for each of you, what's one particular, uh, is mission to rear an or to, like, no. or operation with that you can actually tell me about that actually stands out the most in the history? Well, just, just you know, sort of, um, uh, I mean, there were a lot of interesting stories. Not all of them do I tell, but there was one when, I hadn't traveled in Latin America much. I went to Latin America. I went to um, a country that had a huge drug problem I was, at, I was working uh, out of the uh, American embassy there. I was met at my hotel every morning by uh, an armored car, uh, and there was a car in front of it and a car behind it, and they had guns, and they said, we'll be at your door for 15 seconds at, you know, at 8 o'clock. You either come out the door in the 15 seconds or we leave. We don't sit here and wait for you. And that's when I knew, oh my God, we were talking about personal security, about danger, about worrying about your personal safety. That was when the, the, the CIA started working with uh, the narcotics target. And that was a different group of people. They would shoot you. Uh, in that same trip, I walked down an alley. It was a shortcut between two busy streets and it wasn't a long alley. And there was a group of men talking and I'm walking toward this group of men and they stopped and they all looked at me and I thought, this is a drug deal. And they're gonna think, not that I'm CIA, they're gonna think that I'm DEA and they're gonna shoot me. And I did the only thing that I could do because I'd been, the training said, this is what you do. You, you just keep walking, you walk right through them. I walked right through them, I held my breath and they didn't shoot me, yeah. stuff like that. It was, fun, it was funny you asked the question that way when I was, uh, <clears throat> I was involved in a particular operation, which I, I did not share with my family at the time, but I, we were very concerned about an embassy and, and what sort of, um, I'll say communications, technical gear it was operating out of its, out of its roof. Much as today we're concerned about our, our diplomats in Havana and so forth, what's going on down there. And in this case, um, I was, this is, takes, comes right out of fallout, I was, we overflew the embassy and I occupied the space, you've seen it with an open door, and I was shooting pictures of that, that scene at night, uh, sort of being held back by the, the uh, straps and things behind me. And it was, uh, the adrenaline was flowing, I'll be very candid with you, it was very exciting. We got the pictures we, want, uh, we wanted, and uh, I'd never hung out of a helicopter at night before, that was, that was not my training. I jumped out of a helicopter but for my military training, but I had not overflown a, an embassy at night. So, so this is like a three-part question. The first part is, do you, both of you watch spy movies or do you think they're too, because you live it, you can't really sit through it, but if you do watch them, is there one movie that seems most accurate? Is there one that is really inaccurate to the point where it's ludicrous? <laughs> I, I, 
I don't know about the time here. I'm a yes. Peter's a no on the movie thing. Okay. I can't stand to watch them when they're not correct. So, so, um, so the movie that I call out is Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. I love those kinds of stories about spies. I watch those. Action movies, not so much. Although this action movie blew me away. Yeah, I think uh, I have to second what uh, John has said. I, first of all, I'm a, I'm a mover goer. I, I'll watch movies, spies, whatever, westerns. Um, but I certainly second John on enjoying Tinker Tailor so much. I was involved in counterintelligence, and Tinker Tailor is very much a, a, uh, a duel of wits, and uh, the bottom line of which is you identify a traitor, someone has betrayed your group. And that happens in reality, and I'm, I have been very close to that. And so the, the consequences of it and the effect on people are very real to me. So I, I particularly enjoy that kind of of spy film, but I enjoy the action-oriented spy film as well. So would you say Tinker Tailor is like the most accurate film you've seen in terms of... Well, no, I, I, I think in, in, in we both... In, in uh, tone, <laughs> yeah. in, in tone it's yeah. really good. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not the, it's not the tent pole, it's not the action the thriller thing. But in this movie, there are moments that I think you and I both recognize. Yeah, they, they, they got some of it very, very right. And what wasn't perfectly right was so exciting that I didn't care if it wasn't <laughs> right. <laughs> Mission Impossible Fallout arrives on digital November 20th and on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray, and DVD December 4th.